Those are Fisherman's Wharf. Yeah, Ghirardelli is like right across. He said they're like six blocks from each other. Them cute babies. Just laying. How adorable. It's so pretty here. I think that's Alcatraz over there. I don't know, but I'm gonna definitely find out.
course, no nothing. The workers were kept intimidated because if they didn't comply, their families would starve. At first, when these workers were approached to join the union, they were afraid they might lose this job. When the workers started talking about organizing, management hired lip readers to watch the men talk to each other. Combined with the poor living conditions, lack of food, lack of proper medical attention, and everything else, the auto workers came to the conclusion that there was no way they could ever escape any of this without joining a union. We held meetings in garages and in basements, secret meetings, so the people wouldn't get caught and beaten up. The first sit down was on December 30th. The workers were at the point where they had just had enough and they sat down. That took real guts. The company decided that they had to break the strike the company police and city police started shooting. Mm. At first they were shooting tear gas inside the plant, then they decided to shoot this huge mass of picketers in front of the plant. The police were using rifles, buckshot, fire bombs, and tear gas canisters. It was a shock. We thought that General Motors would try to freeze us out or do something, but not open fire in the middle of the city. When the police misfired, tear gas and bullets went over our heads into the crowds that came out to watch. Workers overturned police cars to make barricades. They ran to pick up the firebombs thrown at them and hurl them back at the police. The men chanted to get me out of the way. You know, that old protect the women and children business. I told them, get away from me. <laughs> Lights went on in my head. I called to the police, cowards, cowards, shooting into the bellies of unarmed men and firing at the mothers of children. Everything became quiet. I thought, the women can break this up. So I appealed to the women in the crowd, break through those police lines and come down and stand beside your husbands and your brothers and your sweethearts. In the dusk, I could see one woman struggling to come forward. As soon as that happened, there were others who followed. That was the end of the battle. There was a big roar of victory. Yes! <laughs> but in a speech he gave at the Riverside Church in New York exactly one year before his assassination, King powerfully denounced the unjust war. Well, I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my consciousness leaves me no other choice. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. 
Over the past two years, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Uh, peace and civil rights don't mix. And when I hear them, I am greatly saddened for such questions means that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment, or my calling. There is at the outset a very obvious and almost facile, con facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging. A few years ago, it seems as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. We have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So we watch them in brutal solidarity burning the huts of a poor village, but we realize that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. As I have walked among desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails, rifles, would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, well, what about Vietnam? They asked if our own nation was using, wasn't using massive doses of violence to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. I am convinced that if I were, if, if we were to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. True compassion is more than, a, more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It seems that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. I am at the 
Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California. I'm at the fort. Oh, there's one of the plane, oh, one of the jets over there. This is Fleet Week, so a lot of the Air Force fighter jets are out here doing their shows. Oh, wow, look at that. The coolest. Very cool. Uh, way out there, that's Alcatraz. The famous prison here in San Francisco. I wanted to take a tour out there, but... Didn't get a chance to get tickets before they sold out. That's San Francisco over there, that's the town. Like I'm on top of the fort right now. Um, God, I can't remember the name of it now. Jeez, I'm gonna have to figure it out. It's, it's really cool. It's like literally right under the Golden Gate Bridge. That's the Golden Gate Bridge. So the fort's literally right underneath it. And it, I don't know if you can see there, but there's the different levels of it down there. I think it's one, two, three, four stories high. That's probably like a lookout tower right there. And of course there's some of the California mountains out there. It's so overcast here, it's hard to see a lot of the stuff. Once again the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. So beautiful here. Different. I don't think I could live here. Um, nonetheless, it's a cool little place to visit. warm up a little bit and watch it from here. Because it is pretty cool. Let's see if I can come down here a little bit without falling and show the different levels of the fort. 